Okay, so this webinar is being recorded. Um, nothing that you say in the chat will be showing up on the screen, just FYI. However, if you do ask a question in the chat, we may repeat your name. Um, if you prefer to ask a question anonymously, you can do that through the Q&A function. So again, your uh, mics and your uh, cameras will be off by default. So if you do want to uh, make a comment or uh, you have any questions, I encourage you to do so in the chat or in the Q&A function. So welcome everyone to our Adulting 101 uh, webinar. This one is going to be all about disinformation and misinformation on social media, something that we have to deal with uh, in our day-to-day -day lives all the time. So my name is Heather Bobrowitz and I am the programming librarian here with uh, STC. And I want to introduce you to our speaker tonight, Mary Blankenship. So Mary is a graduate student researcher with Brookings Mountain West, which is a part of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, she is, uh, well, she researches online misinformation, disinformation, renewable energy, and climate policy, all things that are very current for us. Uh, she holds dual bachelor degrees in chemistry and economics, plus a minor in Brookings public policy. She's currently pursuing a chemistry master's and she continues her research with Brookings Mountain West. Her recent work uh, analyzed 60 million tweets about the Ukrainian invasion, focusing on propaganda linked to the Russian attack and countermeasures. Her published research on Twitter misinformation after George Floyd's killing garnered global attention. She also studied uh, Nigeria's Twitter ban and online reactions to COVID-19, school shootings, mass gun violence, and other uh, topics. In uh, 2020, she interned with Brookings uh, Institution's Africa Growth Institute, uh, or initiative, I apologize, on energy, environment, elections, and COVID-19 misinformation. So she knows a quite a lot about the topic we're going to be discussing tonight. So with that, I'm going to hand you guys over to Mary, and I will disappear, but I will be in the chat in case you guys need me. Thank you so much, Heather, for that kind introduction. Uh, let me know if you guys can't hear me or if you want me to speak louder or slower, I'll be more than happy to. Uh, so I'm going to give perhaps a little uh, further introduction to sort of what my research entails and what I've been doing. But before that, I, because we're limited to the chat function, I want to maybe ask a couple of questions that you guys can think about and maybe respond in the chat if, if you're able to. Um, and so I just wanna hear from you guys in terms of what are some examples of misinformation and disinformation that you ha have come across recently or that has made an impact on you? Um, can everyone else hear me? I just wanna make sure. Yes, we can hear you from okay. here, so it's probably okay. probably just one person having some issues. Cool. It happens. That'd be funny if I just spoke for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I wouldn't let you do that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so uh, two questions in terms of what are the examples of misinformation and disinformation that you have come across? And then also the other um, question of what effects of misinformation uh, and disinformation have you see play out in your life? For example, has it affected the way you've uh, thought about a situation uh, or how family members thought about a situation, things like that. So I'll, I'll give you some time to actually answer that and then I'll continue with a little bit more of my background. Um, and so I've been doing this uh, research on misinformation and disinformation since about uh, 2019. It actually started out uh, with research that I was doing with a fellow from the Brookings Institution named um, uh, Carol Graham. And we were doing research on the effects of um, mass shootings on community well-being 
uh, and uh, after the aftermath of the one October shooting that happened in Las Vegas. And so uh, for that research, we began with sort of traditional uh, survey Gallup data polls that didn't really capture the effects very well. And so the UNLV library, gay libraries, um, uh, actually did a Twitter collection of 14 million tweets of uh, responses to the one October shooting. And so uh, that was sort of this huge data set that we used to try to figure out ways to quantify people's and communities' reactions uh, to mass shootings. Uh, and so through that research, one of the things I noticed was there was actually a lot of conspiracy theories, disinformation, the most bizarre of claims that really permeated deeply through uh, a lot of the tweets. And so that uh, kind of garnered my interest in uh, the topic initially. And after, soon after you had COVID-19 happen and the war in Ukraine. And so it, it just keeps going on and on. Um, so I've researched topics anywhere from uh, the pandemic, uh, the um, claims regarding the presidential election and other elections as well, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, and uh, various mass shootings and very specific uh, events. So uh, feel free throughout the time to ask me questions about um, these, these topics. But I kind of, let me just take a moment and look through um, the comments here. So um, I, I won't mention the names, but I'll just say uh, what some of, some of the things people have written. So everything happening in Palestine, absolutely. Uh, seeing AI generated photos and having to determine if they're real by looking at hands. That's going to become even trickier now because AI is getting better at hands. So um, recently, uh, during COVID pandemic, not knowing what to believe about virus transmission, Ukraine versus Russia, Palestine, Hamas versus Israel, global warming, natural phenomena, uh, reality versus claims, right? These are all very prevalent topics uh, nowadays, especially with uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, and so something that you'll notice is they, um, uh, they, they can really have a widespread of uh, discussions uh, and topics that misinformation and disinformation deals with. So one of the things that um, I'm hoping to convey to you uh, is some things to look out for. Uh, what is the type of disinformation that spreads? Why it spreads? Who, who are susceptible to spreading to disinformation? As college students who are attending uh, this, this lecture, how are you specifically vulnerable to disinformation? Then I wanna give you some examples of specific findings that I found with, with my data and research, and then kind of wrap up of some of the things that you can do yourself to deal with disinformation and misinformation and the shortcomings that uh, of let's say, policy solutions to dealing with these issues. So a lot of things to discuss. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible. So um, I will, what I'm gonna do right now is actually share my screen here. Give me a moment, please. Then I am going to, okay. So I think you should see it. Uh, I won't yep, be able to see, see the chat. Awesome. I won't be able to see the chat, Heather, during this time, but please let me know if there are comments in the chat. Alrighty. Um, so uh, disinformation and misinformation on social media. So let's start with just uh, a very basic definition of misinformation. This is something that we all hear, hear about. Fake news, um, a, a false information, et cetera. So it's simply the spread of false information. And um, what makes it so dangerous and uh, so easily to, to spread is that it preys on the ignorance and our emotional responses. And um, it, it's most successful in uh, spreading 
uh, when it causes uh, the feelings of superiority, anger, and fear, particularly against another group. Uh, that's why, for example, when you have topics like the presidential election or a certain conflict or war, where it's very easy to divide people into certain categories and groups, there you have a lot, and emotions are high because these are situations that are adapting very rapidly. It's very easy for us to get caught up in those emotions and not realize that maybe something that we're seeing isn't necessarily true. Uh, there are a lot of issues that are and consequences associated with misinformation. Uh, some of the main ones that I want to point out is that whenever you come across misinformation, it derails the focus from the actual discussion. So actually talking about the issue at hand and possible solutions uh, to an issue. And then the conversation switches from that to a discussion of if some piece of information is correct or not. So this was really prevalent in the early stages of the Ukraine and Russia war, where you would had uh, different types of Russian disinformation that are, were meant to specifically not only sway uh, uh, certain nations from supporting Ukraine, but delay very crucial and quick response that was necessary of Ukrainian allies, uh, just as an example. Um, uh, and other consequence, and this is a really important one, is that it wipes away the human suffering and cost behind a certain event. You have a mass shooting, uh, the conversation, it, you have, for example, conspiracy theories spreading widely about the shooter or the reason why the shooter uh, committed uh, the, the crime. And so you have the conversation talk about various conspiracy theories and not discuss you know, the victims, the people who have died. Um, and so that's a very common phenomenon that also happens with misinformation and disinformation. So it's rampant, it's important, it's not going away. Misinformation has been around since, well, information, uh, and it's uh, you know, happened uh, anytime you, you have a piece of information, now, though, because of social media and the internet, it's very quickly evolved uh, to be much more pervasive and, let's say, difficult to spot. So uh, I'm sure, though, uh, being in the seminar, you already know these facts, that it's important, rampant, not going away. So there's misinformation, but there's also different types of categories of what uh, has been termed uh, as information pollution. Uh, and so there's three main categories of misinformation pollution. One is, as you know, misinformation. Uh, the other one is disinformation. And the third one is malinformation. So while misinformation is uh, the spread of false information, there is no intent to harm. Uh, there's no intent of harm there. So for example, this is you on Facebook, you come across a piece of vaccine misinformation. You as a concerned person want to retweet it or like it, not retweet it, repost it or like it, et cetera. Uh, and so you unintentionally are per pervading that, uh, that falsehood. Now, disinformation, while it is also false information, there is a specific intention of harm. And this is oftentimes uh, where uh, malicious agents or you have specific disinformation com campaigns that play uh, into uh, the spread of, of disinformation. Uh, what you might also have is something that starts out as disinformation, uh, turn into misinformation. So there's a sort of mix between the, the two. Then you have a third one that doesn't play, let's say, as much of a role in the discourse because it actually is genuine information, but it is intended to harm and includes leaks, harassment, hate speech. So oftentimes, uh, whenever you hear the discussion 
about misinformation, disinformation. You'll also hear a lot of buzzwords like fake news, et cetera. I like the term information pollution. It's uh, the most broadest of sense. And let's say in, in my opinion, the most neutral. So I'll often use that. Uh, but as the name suggests, it essentially um, fogs up the information space and makes it very difficult to see what information you can trust or not and what decision is the right decision. Mary, so, we do have a, a question in the chat. Was mm -hmm. there fake news before social media and the internet? Oh, that's a great question. Absolutely, there was. So um, let me give you, uh, so the term disinformation actually comes from um, uh, sort of the, the Soviet Union. And that was, let's say, a term that, um, let's see, I don't want to uh, propagate any misinformation myself. So <laughs> um, so that was uh, it's essentially a propaganda, a, a dis, disinformatia, so disinformation that was all used very heavily throughout the Cold Wars, throughout different wars. Uh, you had yellow journalism and newspapers that were very prevalent, you know, in the 1930s and 40s, before and after that, that specifically spread claims. And you see that uh, evolving, let's say, from newspapers to a uh, website and news outlets nowadays. So I, I would say absolutely, the term fake news has always been present. Alrighty. So the question, um, one of the questions um, concerning uh, information pollution is do, why do some topics fall victim to information pollution? Um, so uh, there's plenty of reasons. Uh, the, th the three that I think are the most substantial is that a situation uh, that is being reported on, let's say by media outlets, that is fast developing and the facts have not uh, yet been established or confirmed. For example, the uh, what is going on uh, right now between Israel and Palestine. What you'll see is uh, it's not just, uh, let's say conspiracy theorists, it's not just users online, it's uh, also media outlets uh, that, uh, let's say prestigious media outlets uh, that are also spreading information that's not verified. And so you'll have people, you know, that are either trying to get the latest scoop or are trying to do their job and report as fast as possible, but they might not get all of the proper information before doing so. So conflicts, wars, mass shootings, that happen quite a bit. So for example, You'll have um, uh, the one October shooting. The entire shooting itself lasted for about 10 minutes. The first public acknowledgement of the shooting was done on Twitter. And it was a, a user who was claiming that there was a terrorist attack at one of the casinos. So at, literally as the shooting is going on itself, you have people reacting to it immediately. And nowadays what people do is they don't necessarily call 911 or well they may, but they also go directly to social media outlets to check on information or to put out information. Uh, and then uh, you saw also in the early stages of COVID-19, there was a lot of panics. There was a lot of especially different communication about whether to wear a mask or not, for example, that really confused a lot of people and that started this large trend of misinformation that happened afterwards. Then there's topics that are difficult to discern what is fact or not. This is especially true for uh, scientific topics like climate change, like vaccines, or uh, like diet fads as well. This is especially prevalent on TikTok. Uh, and then you have also political events like election fraud claims, where there's claims, uh, you know, there's evidence to support that there's some fraud versus there's evidence that refutes those claims, right? And so there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of different studies 
with varying degrees of, let's say, uh, quality in their study. And I'm seeing some more in the chat. I don't want to, let's see. OK. Yes, um, there's a question about which country has the most uh, misinformation across in uh, recent history. I'm not sure if that's something mm -hmm. we can necessarily qualify, can we? Yeah, that, that's really difficult. And this is actually a big problem with uh, research concerning disinformation, misinformation. A lot of it is qualitative and not quantitative. Now, don't get me wrong, qualitative research is extremely important uh, and is often sort of very quick to do. So you can get very immediate analysis on these developing situations. But qualitative research, uh, is you don't see as often related to social media. And uh, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit when we get to some of the data analysis and research that I have done. It is very difficult uh, to, um, let's say, uh, to fully capture the effects and um, the, the spread of information pollution. And one of the reasons is the data that's available. Most social media data is inaccessible, even to academics. You have to have a very expensive, oftentimes, uh, and a specific contract to do research. And also that uh, it's, it's fast evolving. So something that a researcher learned two years ago may no longer be accurate, you know, with new technologies and more advanced technologies popping up. Um, there was also other reasons, but we'll, we'll get to that later on. Um, yes, so uh, so it's difficult to uh, discern what is fact or not, and also for events that trigger emotional responses. So uh, like I've said before, conflicts, uh, presidential elections, there were a lot of uh, anger and fear surrounding that, um, as well as, as, as plenty of, of other topics. Um, so for these uh, disinformation and misinformation topics, who is most likely to spread? I don't know if my, there you go. Who's most likely to spread misinformation and disinformation? So in a general sense, individuals who are older, less educated, lower in socioeconomic status, in rural areas are more likely to be susceptible to information pollution. But that's not the only markers that are important. There's new research that is being conducted uh, by one of my uh, colleagues at uh, the Brookings Institution, Carol Graham. And so, uh, there's also uh, newly developed research about the effects that happiness, well-being, and despair has to play a role into um, uh, individuals and communities that are more vulnerable to misinformation. And so their initial research shows that individuals experiencing deep levels of despair, and also these are also communities that have high opioid-related deaths, high, higher suicide rates, more crime, uh, so, uh, less of safety nets, uh, are more vulnerable to misinformation. Then there's also cognitive factors and uh, also uh, this sort of difference between healthy versus unhealthy skepticism. And uh, maybe sort of um, while I continue the, uh, the discussion, Maybe you can kind of think what is really the difference between those two and what is healthy skepticism versus unhealthy skepticism. So a little uh, more about the psychological drivers for misinformation and disinformation. This is a great study done uh, and published with uh, Nature. Um, so there's cognitive drivers to why someone would uh, be susceptible to false beliefs like a lack of analytical thinking or deliberation, a neglect uh, source cues or knowledge, forget sources or counter evidence, 
of sort of the uh, illusory truth, so familiarity, fluency, cohesion. Uh, you know, does something um, uh, agree or disagree with the person's worldview? That plays an important role. Then there's um, a socio-effective drivers, like uh, sort of a source cue. So from who does the information originate from? An elite group, an in-group, someone that is sort of within that person's um, uh, group, um, and attractiveness, uh, the emotional information and emotional state of the person, and then worldview, so personal view and partisanships. So, uh, and this is, these are drivers that are present within every single person. So although if these individuals are more likely to be susceptible to information pollution, at the end of the day, we are all susceptible to misinformation and disinformation. Now I want to, uh, sort of focus in a little bit more on college students, since I think that's probably the, the main audience today. And so, um, and talk about some of the ways that college students specifically are vulnerable. And one of the biggest ways is that college students are the most frequent users of social media, young people in general, and therefore have uh, the most exposure to information pollution. And as we find out, college students are actually not that great at um, pointing out and evaluating their own skill set regarding identifying fake news. So there's a study that was conducted by Rutgers where students were not able to accurately assess the level of skill in evaluating fake news. And then students uh, correctly identified only about 65% of fake news and 61% of real news stories. And then uh, studies concerning the 2020 presidential election specifically, and that focused on young, new, first-time voters, is that 95% of students never located the PR firm behind supposedly nonpartisan websites. And students, when they try to identify what was a, a reputable versus an unreputable site, they place undue weight on the look of the website. Does it look polished or not? Uh, and easily manipulated signals of credibility. So having a news agency say that not profit or nonpartisan or the organizations about page uh, that does not give accurate information about the organization. So then there's the question of why even bother spreading this information? Who profits from it? As it turns out, this information is actually very profitable. And I, let me take a step back here. So here's an example of a disinformation website. And so uh, as you can see, it's made to look very similar to a real news uh, website. And so looking back from what, what students placed sort of the weight upon when deciding whether something is, is real or not, you know, it's, it's very easy when you look at a website like this uh, to view it as a legitimate news source uh, instead of one that is made to uh, produce this information and make money off of it. And I recommend checking out uh, this um, article. It gives a really good run through of what are the main types of disinformation news sites that are present uh, online. So with a lot of disinformation websites, they generate money through ads. And according to Global uh, Disinformation Index, disinformation websites generated over $235 million um, in 2019 across only 20,000 domains. You also have uh, different disinformation uh, groups create uh, FundMe, uh, uh, GoFundMe go accounts that pose as 
right wing uh, funding campaign. So for example, uh, as was done with the Canadian uh, Freedom Convoy where this Facebook group uh, raised $7 million before Facebook was even able to locate them and block do further donations from the organization. And they were not actually part of uh, the, uh, the, the Freedom Convoy, as an example. Then there's political power. This is especially true with advocacy groups. Oh, sorry, I, I missed uh, anti-woke brands. Um, and uh, with anti-woke brands, one of the things that will happen is uh, they will associate themselves or they will also try to propagate various types of disinformation and misinformation if it's, for example, about uh, if the company uh, touts itself on being anti-LGBTQ or anti-trans or anti-abortion, uh, they will um, often incorporate information that's not accurate or true about their stance. Then there's political power. Uh, and um, we see this with advocacy groups. Uh, we also see this with political candidates nowadays. Uh, I think with uh, President Trump, one of the ways that uh, he was able to uh, gain attention and influence through social media, and then also influence as well. There's a lot of, uh, there's some cases of social media users who uh, have a lot of influence online that also then become pundits on various uh, news organizations or have their own shows and podcasts. I think that that's very prevalent. And again, I just wanna, for emphasis, <laughs> point out that money uh, really drives this information. Oh, and also uh, back to political power as well. Uh, this is also really prevalent in the case of Russian disinformation and the political sway that they are uh, trying to enforce, uh, not just in the 2016 election, but also with, with the recent war in Ukraine. Um, so uh, if there's any questions, I don't know, I could uh, take a quick uh, pause. Let me see if I glanced over any. Um, there is a question about how would misinformation be present in sociology? I guess that also is uh, uh, answered by the whole despair um uh article and whatnot that i also we we have access to so i was able okay. to bring up a a uh, a link to that um uh if you want to uh clarify a little bit more question asker that would be fantastic if that's not what your what your question is yeah and i'll be happy to touch upon uh, more about the wellness and despair I think that's actually a very important uh, new research and finding that is going on in regards to misinformation and disinformation. Uh, but I can also discuss that again at the end of the talk. Okay, um, so um, now I wanna just chat a little bit more about some of the research myself that I have done and the, the main findings regarding the data. So. Uh, I've collected over a billion tweets on a variety of different topics, uh, ranging from, uh, well, I already gave you the list. And so I work with typically uh, with like terabytes of data for this research and uh, typically in the scale of, of tens of millions, if not more. And so, and here I talk about tweets specifically because um, this was sort of before the current owner of Twitter, where now uh, I don't have this sort of same access anymore. Uh, so I'll just call them tweets still um, to, um, to just in reference that I'm talking about the old Twitter, not the, the new X. So essentially how my research has been conducted is 
there's tweets that are generated online. Uh, with the developer access that I used to have on the platform, I was able to collect tweets that have a specific uh, word in them, either in hashtag or just within the full sort of text of the post. So in this case, it, it's tweets that contain the words Ukraine, Ukrainian, Russia, Russian. And then from them, I can extract specific variables that are of interest to me. An actual post that you see on Twitter or X has over, excuse me, 200 different variables. So you can actually gain really in-depth uh, analysis of a certain topic or discussion. But in my case, I'm really worried about the time that the tweet was created at, the full name and uh, the full text of the tweet, the uh, unique ID of that uh, specific post, the screen name or username, the uh, user defined location uh, of, of the account that made the tweet, and then the, the description or a bio of the account, and then the, uh, the time of which this, the account itself was created at. This proved to be very important whenever we've looked at the effects of bot accounts or um, specific disinformation campaigns. Because what you'll find is as an event is developing, you'll have this influx of newly created account within you know, an hour of an event breaking headlines. And then from there, I can make sub collections of tweets that pertain to a specific topic or claim or group. And then from the full text of the tweet, I can extract the emojis and uh, the um, hashtags that was used within the post. And uh, this is something that I've developed with Carol Graham, where we can then bundle up the different emojis that were used and correspond them, correlate them to uh, possible emotions that they can represent. Um, and so, yeah, here's um, just a description of the um, uh, of the variables I just went through. Uh, and from them, we can find out a lot of uh, different uh, questions that we may have about a topic. So for example, regarding the George Floyd murder, uh, one of the things that um, I was able to find in this research uh, is sort of taking the hashtag and uh, looking at the locations of the users who use that hashtag uh, and sort of comparing it, uh, the locations as time went by. And so in this case, we can see how uh, the conversation that started or was just mostly contained to within Minneapolis really spread out uh, within different portions of the United States. So hashtags are a really useful way of gauging the conversation because it's oftentimes really difficult to always take a look at the full text of a post. But then what we also find is based on the different subgroups and subcategories of users that we've created, there's also very different hashtag usages between those groups. So for example, uh, this study here was used to evaluate the effects of the, the responses of users who were pro-gun control and a left-leaning versus users who are pro-gun and right-leaning in response to the Buffalo and the Uvalde shootings uh, um, a year back. And so here you can see that for the, the, uh, the left-leaning and pro-gun control group, it was uh, used hashtags like in gun violence, uh, Black Lives Matter, Dem Voices, uh, Fox News breeds terrorism, Buffalo Strong, and, and then versus the pro-gun right-leaning group that's all focused on things like white supremacy, white Kesha, uh, Pagan, uh, fake news. Um, so something that you'll see uh, that is um, a type of mechanism uh, for dealing with the situation is uh, called whataboutism. And this is really prevalent with uh, pro-gun right-leaning users in response to mass shooting. This was really pre uh, prevalent 
uh, with users around the world when discussing the Ukraine and Russia war is that people will try to switch the conversation onto a different topic, not necessarily by feeding misinformation and disinformation, but saying, what about, why are we talking about this topic? What about something that's going on somewhere else or about like a different uh, topic? So one of the things that you'll notice with misinformation, disinformation, what about ism, uh, these uh, sort of tactics is they're really meant to uh, shift the conversation away from the actual discussion and the topic. Then what we'll notice is uh, so uh, different um, groups um, have also different uh, emotional responses uh, to an event. So for example, this is the, the same study that also, again, compares pro-gun and right-leaning versus gun control and left-leaning groups. And by extracting sort of the yellow face emo emojis uh, that are typically used within tweets and um, uh, categorizing them between anger, disgust, fear, sadness, uh, happiness, and sadness, you can have these relative comparisons between groups and events. So for example, we noticed uh, that uh, pro-gun right-leaning users showed much more fear. And um, in the tweets themselves, um, it talked about uh, this, uh, these shootings being an uh, inside job uh, that is meant to take away people's guns. Um, and so the fear was really about taking away the guns in this case versus um, gun control and left-leaning group that showed a uh, greater amounts of anger than the pro-gun right-leaning group. Now this of course uh, changed a little bit with the Uvalde shooting because it's also a very different situation, a very different type of shooting. Um, this was a, um, a, a 18 year old man went into a predominantly black community in Buffalo, New York and uh, committed a mass shooting uh, in, in Buffalo uh, versus this school shooting uh, in Uvalde, Texas. Um, so you see here that there's much greater uh, percentages of sadness that are shown. Uh, you still see more fear that corresponds to the pro-gun right-leaning users. And so what we found uh, throughout different studies across different topics that oftentimes uh, um, users that show greater amounts of anger or greater amounts of fear are also propagating misinformation and disinformation um, regarding a certain topic. So uh, I'm conscious of my time. So uh, I, I'll go, I'll, I'll kind of skip over a couple of slides, but um, the, one of the main things to always keep in mind is that, and I found this time and time again, is that claims that exploit existing tensions and grievances within a population are the most widely spread on social media. You can have that be on a very local scale uh, versus a very large scale like a continent or a nation. And so uh, I've seen this specifically around the Ukraine and Russia war where you'll have different campaigns throughout different uh, parts of the world and throughout sort of different countries um, that sort of focus on the local issues uh, and um, uh, that sort of tie in into a topic that's essentially unrelated to the actual issue, which in that case was the Russia-Ukraine war. You also had the same thing with COVID-19. Um, and other topics as well. Um, so yes, and let me see what other, um, then um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, most of the conversations that you see on social media, in this case, specifically Twitter, are dominated uh, by uh, the top retweeted accounts. And so users with uh, these huge amounts of, uh, of, of followers really dominate what you see online. 
since most of the content that you see on social media are retweets, they're not original posts. And so um, the, the last thing I want to discuss before we can head into our Q&A portion is uh, some of the steps that you can take. Um, so for, for you specifically is don't interact with posts, the posts that are emotionally charged. So one thing that um, if people do is, you know, even when they are trying to repost a, a post and trying to disagree with it, they don't realize that for an algorithm, it, it there, there isn't a way for the algorithm to know if you're disagreeing or agreeing with a certain post. They're just seeing that the post is having engagement. And so that, that's what matters for an algorithm. Um, so oftentimes I will advise people not to interact with a piece of misinformation and disinformation that they see, period. Then it's also important to fact check information that you see. There's uh, different tools available. Uh, this is mostly uh, garnered for X and Twitter, but uh, there's also tools available for other uh, social media sites. And then also uh, check local news and public service media as well. Uh, I've been through a few discussions uh, with um, um, uh, policy discussions about sort of what companies can do, what governments can do. At the end of the day, it's, it's really difficult to enable policy action because it almost instant, instantly becomes a question about censorship and freedom of access to information. And uh, it's always really important to keep in mind how policy action, tech company action, how they limit your access to information and how they can essentially in the future be used uh, for purposes that are not just. So one of the things that's really common in authoritarian nations is under the guise of um, trying to, I'm gonna actually maybe, um, so under the guise of trying to uh, deal with fake news or information um, pollution, um, what they'll actually do is they'll ban social media outlets. They'll put journalists in jail who they claim spread fake news or uh, misinformation. Uh, they'll cut off internet access and they'll actually punish uh, specific individuals who, uh, you know, maybe write something that is against uh, a politician or a government, uh, and who would they other claim would be a fake news. So it's very difficult to actually deal with disinformation and misinformation from a, a government and from a tech company perspective. So it unfortunately, a lot of times, falls on the people and the users themselves to do the work, which is a lot to actually ask for an individual. I mean, we're so busy in our day anyways, but we have to unfortunately be expected to almost be an expert in every single thing and every single uh, breaking story that comes out. So I can understand especially why it can be so challenging uh, to deal with uh, misinformation and disinformation. So with that, um, I'd be happy to answer any of remaining questions that you guys may have. I will pop back on the screen so that you are not alone up here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so if you guys have any more questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I know that we had one question about uh, sociology. I wasn't sure if that was the field of sociology after I, I reread the question. Um, whether the the misinformation shows up in the field of sociology i imagine it does i imagine misinformation disinformation is something that basically comes up in all different fields mm -hmm. um in some way or another um i know i i gave an example of prior to the internet fake um 
uh, fake news kind of stories, what we used to call hoaxes, um, things like uh, Bat Boy in the world news. Um, oh, what's that? It was uh, it was one that you would see on, um, you know, those tabloid kind of uh, um newspapers in the 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 um checkout line at the grocery store mm -hmm. uh bat boy is one of the famous ones it's like a a basically it's someone in prosthetics and everything oh. looking, <laughs> looking like a horror movie but they they constantly were like this is bat boy and he was <laughs> he was supposedly a a uh, child that was born that looked that way that yeah um was not it it was it was very much like sensationalized made mm -hmm. to sell kind of information um what area is misinformation the most prevalent in um I'm not sure if that's something that can be answered yeah, I, I know we see it a lot with health and medical information especially recently yeah, so I, th I think it typically follows under the, the three categories I, I sort of mentioned in uh, the talk. So, you know, a, 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 a quickly developing situation, um, scientific uh, information, right, um, like health, like climate change. Um, and, you know, what's interesting, too, is a scientist themselves will fall victim to this misinformation. Uh, and so that could be uh, especially frustrating. Uh, and then uh, topics that elicit a very emotional response. So for example, what we're seeing right now in with Israel and Palestine, I mean, whatever side of the conflict or th that you're on, like the images and the stories as they're developing are very heartbreaking. And it's it's very, you know, it's it pulls on your emotional responses to immediately want to share and let people know um, of uh, of what the travesties that are happening. And so, without really taking a step back and checking, what are some of the things that I'm actually seeing? Um, so it's it's very difficult. One thing that I didn't talk about in this talk is also the presence of bots and trolls and cyborgs and AI. Uh, that is in itself another Pandora's box that could take me like a whole, another whole talk to, to discuss. And I'm not an expert uh, in identifying AI on social media. I've had some um, experience with uh, trying to identify bots and troll accounts. And I will tell you just with those, uh, just the presence of bots is actually really difficult to identify because there isn't just one factor that um, um, sort of um, it puts an account in the, under the category of bots. It's really a combination of 40 and 50 different variables that you have to consider. And at the end, the best you can do is come up with uh, sort of an evaluation if this account is more human-like or bot-like. But very, very rarely is there a clear distinction if an account is a bot, let alone a troll, which is uh, um, a real account, but uh, with the clear intention of trolling and satire. Uh, and then you have also AI. Um, you saw in the Ukraine um, a Russia war that it was uh, the first instance of an AI image that was used as propaganda and as like disinformation. And it was actually on, not on the Russian side, it was a, a AI generated image of Putin uh, kneeling um, in front of the, the Chinese um, uh, president. And so um, as, as an example, you saw recently also with uh, the the media coverage of the Trump hearings. There was a lot of AI generated images you know, of Trump in a mugshot, of Trump walking around in a prison's uniform. So it, it's becoming, uh, it, it's slowly being far more integrated within our, uh, like the, the, the media sort of uh, posts that we see uh, as we're browsing through. 
And uh, what's really scary is that with deep fakes and with, with generated um, images that are becoming more advanced. So, you know, uh, looking at hands may not be uh, a good indicator anymore. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's becoming a very difficult. I think at the end of the day, um, it, really making sure that you step back uh, from, you know, um, perpetuating misinformation, whether that's through posting, liking, or replying, if you notice that it's giving you a uh, a very sort of illicit emotional response to a situation, that's very important. And if you read something that is a, from a news outlet or a or, or a source, even a journalist, there's many. Um, so taking a step back and actually researching, making sure that it's a, a reputable journal, journalist or a media outlet, that's also very difficult. Um, something, one of the things that I noticed in uh, when I was looking at the responses to the Ukraine uh, Russia war in uh, Global South audiences, specifically, more specifically in Africa is that there were a lot of um, users who claimed themselves to be independent journalists from various Latin American uh, countries and um, um, I think Middle Eastern countries as well um, that spread a majority of conspiracy theories and disinformation. So it's, I wish I had a good answer, but I'm hoping that this talk can give you some uh, indications of what to watch out for and maybe some of uh, the steps you can take yourself to make sure that you're not part of, of the spread of, of information pollution. Yeah, that is the, it is the million dollar question. What do we mm -hmm. do about it? How do we fix it? And yeah, the, 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 the answer is not, is not yet available, <laughs> but hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think um, uh, whenever you hear a quote, easy solution being proposed when dealing with this issue, immediately don't trust it because just from discussions that I've had and sort of thinking through this issue itself, there really isn't an easy solution. So yeah, there was a, a a comment in the chat that um, uh, this person finds it very difficult to follow so much information to try to figure out what is false and what is not. And that is, you know, it is part of our, our existence now. We are just bombarded with so much information all the time. I know that um, there was a panic about that uh, back in the 80s and 90s with the whole 24-hour news cycle. Mm -hmm. um, where it was suddenly a thing where we had access to the news so often and we had newscasts that happened in the morning and in mm -hmm. the afternoon and in the evening and then after dinner and everything. And that was that was something that we felt bombarded by. And nowadays that seems kind of quaint. You know, it yeah. seems like it would be nice to only get the news a few times a day. Now it's and, whenever we look yeah. at our phones. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, there was a similar type of panic when the newspaper first started to be prevalent, right? So I think you're going to have this type of panic every time you have a new type of media outlet um, or a, a new type of, of way to disseminate information. For us with social media, this is actually a pretty recent phenomenon that we really don't know how to deal yet. I mean, we live in an era of information, but not in an era of understanding. Uh, and so it's it, we haven't really had the chance yet to really adapt with so much information that we're seeing. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Mary. It doesn't look like we have any more questions in the chat, but I imagine all of us are probably thinking about all the different ways that we encounter uh, <laughs> misinformation and, you know, or dubious information, I guess, more than anything um, all the time. And you've given us a lot to think about. So thank you so much again.
Um, and thank you everyone for attending tonight. Uh, like I mentioned before, you will be getting uh, certificates of attendance provided you have been here for the bulk of the webinar and that should be within the next couple of days. Um, I'll be the one handling those. So again, if you have any questions or you are waiting for that, that uh, certificate to come along in your email and you have not gotten it yet, uh, you feel free to email me. I will put my email in the chat one more time because it is a bit long. Um, and thank you again, Mary, for for giving us so much to think about um, and so much to uh, to look into. Um, and yeah, um, thank you for for giving us so much to think about. <laughs> yeah, thank you so. for having me. Hope this was useful. All right. Well, with that, um, since I want to honor everyone's time, I'm going to stop the recording.